two. Welcome, everybody. I can get a hammer out of one of the drawers. We got those. There we go. Welcome, everyone. For those of you who it's your first time in our building, welcome to the Indianapolis Propylaeum. We are so excited to have you here. For those of our members, for those who have been with us before, we're so excited to have you back. My name is Allie Brown. I'm the executive director here at the Indianapolis Propylaeum. Um, I am on my finishing up my third month. And I have to tell you, as, as optimistic as I was, if you got to see me at the first week, I am more optimistic about the power of women because I get to hang out with these amazing women every day and work towards women's leadership, arts and culture, and historic preservation. So I'm so very excited to have you all here tonight and to go talk about uh, early, uh, your young child in Indiana and how important early learning is as part of our Women's Enrichment Series, focusing on lifelong learning. Just a few logistical uh, things for you. We have two bathrooms on this floor. There is one right here in the, right by the staircase, and there's another one right through the conference room that's behind me. There are other bathrooms upstairs. Wander if you would like. Um, don't get lost. Um, and uh, feel free if you need to get up, stretch your legs or anything. We, we also have a cash bar over here on this side if you're thirsty. Um, I also want to tell you about some upcoming events that we have coming up. So uh, our members are familiar, but if everyone isn't, uh, next year will be the 135th year of the Propylaeum in existence and our 100th year in this house. So we are going to be celebrating that and kicking off that celebration Wednesday, November 9th with our ribbon tying ceremony. Instead of cutting a ribbon, we're going to be tying our future and our past together as we step into the next 100 years. That'll be an amazing event. It's at 2 o'clock. It's in the middle of the day along with an open house following that. And then following uh, that pretty quickly, that Saturday is our biggest event of the year. It is the Salon Society Gala, um, where we celebrate the history of women getting together to uh, cause a clamor. So this, the <laughs> so this year, uh, because we're celebrating our 100th year, we're going to be harking back to 1923 and having an amazing live jazz band will be here. Um, we'll have some auction items. We have the most beautiful tiles. So we're auctioning off pieces of slate tile that were the original roof on our building that have been painted by local artists, including our very own Marion Glick, um, <laughs> along with many others and Heron Art students, which if you didn't know, our founder, May Wright Sewell, also helped to found Heron School of Art. So we're tying it all back together. So we'll have that along with a wine pool and an envelope pool and just a fun night, uh, a little light scavenger hunt throughout the house too. So that'll be a blast. Following that, we enter our holiday season full blast. Um, on, no, on December 7th, we will have our holiday open house. So the house will be all decorated and beautiful for you. Um, that's an evening event. The details are on our website. And then on December 14th, the holiday tea is back. So uh, we'll be having the holiday tea. You can also start making reservations during, on our website. Um, I am so excited to be up here today, not only as, as a five-year-old son, so the struggles of early learning are not that far behind me. Very lucky to have a kindergartner now. Um, but I can't imagine the stresses of what it's like to just walk in and not have the supports that I was lucky enough to have. And the women who are going to speak to you tonight work so hard on that. But we're an organization of women lifting up women, so I'm very excited to be able to introduce uh, the title sponsor tonight. Um, Marianne Glick, who has been a woman who supports women. Marianne not only has lift, <laughs> has, um, she's, I just, she's like a hero of mine. She, <laughs> she started her own business and efficiency and organ, and, and business, and it's, it's just amazing. And she's gone on to not only do amazing things, but to then put those amazing things back out into the community, whether that's through her uh, Glick Philanthropies, where she sits as the president and works with nonprofits. And she doesn't remember this, but the first time I met her, I was working on a program to get young people into the construction. And I sat down with Marianne and a couple other people from the construction industry, 
And she talked about her passion in getting kids summer jobs and knowing that that could lead to a brighter future if we could just connect them. And she was willing to do the work to help us connect them. She's the kind of person who not only believes in things and puts money behind things, but she puts herself behind things. Thus, uh, her support here. Um, as a young woman, kind of young woman in Indiana, in Indianapolis, women like Marianne are, are people that we look up to because she did the work and she gives it all back. And that's, that's what we need. So I'm very excited to be able to introduce Marianne Glick. That's really nice. <laughs> Thanks. Well, welcome this evening. I'm so happy to welcome you to the first in this year's Marilyn K. Glick Women's Enrichment Series. Uh, the series is named after my mother, who was a very dynamic leader in her own right and really fought to get better things for women. And so I, I'm pleased to follow in her steps. Uh, the theme of this year's series is lifelong learning. And education serves as a catalyst for growth and opportunity. This is exactly what motivated the women who became the founders of the Propylium. One of the founding women was Elizabeth Eliza Blaker. She founded the Teachers College of Indianapolis in 1880, which merged with Butler University to become the Butler College of Education in 1930. Eliza was an early proponent of early childhood education in the Midwest, and she offered classes and other forms of support to families because she knew that young children needed support to be successful. Eliza was invited to move to Indianapolis by a group of wealthy people to start a school for their children. And she replied that she would come only if all children could attend the schools. She also helped found the Indianapolis Free Kindergarten Society, and she placed kindergartners in minority, kindergartens in minority and immigrant neighborhoods. It is in the spirit of Eliza Blaker that I'm honored to introduce tonight's speakers, Maureen Weber and Tammy Silverman. Maureen is the president and CEO of Early Learning Indiana. She earned her JD from Georgetown University Law Center and BS from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She chairs the board of Purdue Polytech High School and is a board member of Notre Dame Ace Academy Schools in Indianapolis. In 2021, she was named Indianapolis Business Journal Woman of Influence. Maureen has spent her career working across multiple sectors with an emphasis on human capital development and education to improve the way that organizations meet the needs of individuals they serve. At the helm of Early Learning Indiana, Indiana's oldest and most comprehensive provider of early learning services, Maureen's leadership with early learning addresses systematic barriers to early education statewide and operates a network of 10 early learning centers in Indianapolis and West Lafayette. Please join me in welcoming Maureen this evening. Come on. Tammy Silverman is president and CEO of the Indiana Youth Institute. Teaching is in Tammy's DNA. She comes from a family of 16 teachers, counselors, and school administrators. Tammy earned her bachelor's from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business and master's and doctorate degrees in public administration from the University of Illinois. She currently serves on the Indiana Department of Workforce Development Cabinet Youth Committee, the Indiana Criminal Justice Authority Juvenile Justice State Advisory Group, and Indiana University Society of Aeons. Thank you. <laughs> However, it was Tammy's early work with thousands of homeless, often traumatized children, where she confronted firsthand how some children face seemingly 
insurmountable challenges, while others are born with immense resources and support. This has sparked her passion for ensuring that all children can reach their full potential. Tammy brings her immense experience in family violence prevention and youth leadership and service to the Indiana Youth Institute. Please help me in welcoming Tammy. I know you're really going to enjoy hearing and you will also learn a lot from Tammy and Maureen this evening. Thank you, ladies. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mary Ann, uh, for your deep commitment to learning at every age, um, and to Allie for providing us this marvelous opportunity way back there, um, and also to Deborah Rankins for uh, inviting me here tonight. Um, I'm gonna set the stage a little bit uh, with some background information on um, where we are in terms of our progress for caring for very young children, and then I'll uh, join Tammy and the comfy chairs over here for a little bit more conversation as we delve into the challenges together. Um, I feel as though I need to warn you, the last time I presented to a large group, um, I subsequently contracted COVID. Um, but so to the people in the front row, it was just a couple weeks ago, so you've never been safer. Um, uh, instinctively, the the work of early learning is often judged by the simplicity of its anticipated outputs, right? We think about um, if we do our job perfectly, we will have children who are healthy, who are kept safe, who are capable of such really impressive feats as standing in a line, maybe doing a puzzle, saying their alphabet, or showing kindness to their neighbor. And as I drove here tonight and passed some of the political signs, I thought, you know, that last one might require a little more work um, than we've been giving it. In all seriousness, though, what seems as simple as Silly Songs and Sesame Street is really unexpectedly complex. It starts with the very children and families that we aim to serve. For many young families, the decision of where a child spends 40 hours of their week um, might hinge on a uh, you know, hard-hitting question like, um, are diapers or formula included in the cost of care or not? Mm. Or the simple reality that the only care option that's available to a mom or dad uh, during their shift is, is this one or that one. I worry about the trade-offs that these families face. But the things that really keep me up at night are the life experiences of some of the children that we serve. I'll share just a few. Like the siblings whose parents got drunk and never returned to pick them up at our Eastern Star facility one evening, just didn't come back that day. Or my young friends who enter our kindergarten, pre-kindergarten classes with a vocabulary measuring in dozens of words rather than the thousands of words that our children uh, likely knew at that time. Or the children who are startlingly ravenous on Monday mornings at breakfast, and I can only assume that their weekends didn't include three meals a day. Many, and hopefully most, young children, regardless of income level, receive everything they need to ensure healthy brain development from the adults in their lives. Yet the data is clear that in too many circumstances, this simply isn't the case. And the lifetime consequences stemming from those early experiences can often be just devastating. Indeed, the centrality of the first five years of life to the brain architecture is really not in dispute. The brain develops more rapidly during these years than at any other time of life. Intuitively, we, intu intuitively we know this to be true. Um, neural pathways are formed by something as simple as responsive relationships with caring adults, or they're destroyed by the kinds of experiences that we know many children in our midst have. A brain's plasticity decreases over time making any shortcomings in this initial wiring uh, harder and more costly to overcome. Those of you who are in and around K-12 education, you see it happen every day, you know it can be done, um, but we pay for it. And Tammy and I will talk about that more in just a few minutes. I'd argue that the impact of effective early learning on a child's development is reason enough to desire a thriving early learning sector in Indiana and beyond. However, this system provides us with a really important ancillary benefit too, and that is a productive workforce. 
In the face of historically and persistently low unemployment rates, we can't afford to have willing and qualified workers on the sidelines. And yet, Indiana's labor force participation rate for young women with children lags the nation as a whole coming out of the pandemic. And the rate for single moms in particular is down six percentage points from where we were just a couple of years ago. While much is made about the difference between childcare on the one hand and early learning on the other, um, our understanding of brain development has made clear that all early care experiences are in fact also early learning experiences. Given the rapid pace of development during this early life stage, the environments in which children spend this time really matters, especially for children who are not receiving the kinds of nurturing experiences that we know lead to that healthy brain, brain development. So how are we doing in terms of making sure that Hoosier families have what they need uh, in, to access high quality early learning? The past three years have represented a time of diverging paths in early childhood education. On the one hand, unparalleled public spending has temporarily expanded affordability for vulnerable families in ways that we wouldn't have dreamed about in 2019. Increased, uh, the, these funds have increased the sustainability of the supply of early care, and they've encouraged us to experiment with new things. Meanwhile, appreciation for the value of child care has probably never been higher as employers look for strategies to attract especially their young uh, team members. Yet at the same time, competing demands and a persistent and substantial workforce short shortfall threaten to erode the quality of early learning outcomes that we're achieving. Really hard to do it when you don't have the caregivers. And increasing costs are putting high quality care farther out of reach for not just low income families, but moderate income families as well. The upshot of all of this is a really volatile environment that is full of opportunity, but also really, really with risk. Statewide, Indiana has the license capacity to serve just six in 10 children likely to be in need of care. There's good news in places like Marion County where the investments of the United Way of Central Indiana and others, including many of you in this room, um, have really turned the, the corner so that we have sufficient supply of early care and education. We just have to continue to work on the quality here. In nearly two thirds of Indiana counties, however, we have capacity to serve less than half of the children in need of care. Um, it, in the Continuing and a special concern is the state of our infants and toddlers. Um, for any of you who have young children, you know how challenging this can be uh, for a lot of reasons that we can talk about later. Um, it's hard to provide infant and toddler care, and so we often find that families call us much too late because they didn't know that they needed to call us long before they knew they were pregnant. <laughs> in, in Indiana, we evaluate quality using a rating system we call paths to quality and here too we've had significant progress in recent years more than but still more than 70 percent of counties across indiana can serve less than a quarter of the children that they need with high quality care and one indiana county still lacks a single high quality seat we're working on that one Perhaps even more important than these quality ratings though, we're learning more about whether the early learning system is delivering the kindergarten ready skills that we know that children need to have for our partners in K-12. For too long, the work of the early education sector has occurred pretty much in darkness. We just didn't know how well we were doing. Um, we didn't have a lot of data about how, whether we were leveling the playing field and particularly not um, in connection with low-income children or uh, when we disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Recent data has started to fill these gaps. And while there's cause for optimism in these results, it's clear that Indiana hasn't yet fully realized the potential of high-quality early learning experiences. Indeed, we see an achievement gap developing for vulnerable children by the time they're four years old. We have a lot more work to do. The last factor I'll talk about in ensuring access is affordability. Early learning services haven't escaped the inflationary effects we're seeing in so many other parts of the economy. Statewide, though it's always been difficult, it got harder for families to afford early learning services over the last year. The federal government recommends that income, or the, the cost of childcare, that families pay no more than 7% of their income on childcare services. In Indiana, the average pay, family is paying about 12 and a half percent. 
<laughs> it's, it's real. In fact, many families pay more for a year of early care and education than they do for a year of college tuition. Without the benefits of Stafford loans and Pell Grants and 529 plans, and with far less time to save for those events than, um, than we have for college. Still early in their careers, most young families are quite price sensitive and will choose lower quality settings of care when faced with escalating tuition costs. Makes all the sense in the world. Predictably, the net result of this is that the children who might benefit from the most often miss out. For all Hoosier children, but especially for the most vulnerable among us, the opportunity to access a truly high quality early learning environment complete with nutritious food, with responsive and caring adults, and the opportunity to develop essential skills has the potential to embed the seeds of all future learning. We adults just have to push through all this complexity I've just talked about to take full advantage of these early years. So to talk more about these challenge, challenges, I will uh, join Tammy over here and um, we will uh, discuss a few questions and then take some from you, so be thinking. Troy told us ahead of time he would take care of us. He is. <laughs> he is. We definitely do. Uh, you've gotten to hear from me a little bit. I'd love for you to get to hear from, uh, from Tammy as well. And so, Tammy, I wonder if you might just start off our, our chat a little bit today by sharing with the room what it is that interests you about this conversation in particular and at this moment, thinking about um, not only your work, but uh, your work on the home front, too. Sure. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> I, think I, I think it was on and I had turned it off, so I'm sorry about that. First of all, I would just like to thank Marianne uh, for, for being one of those mentors for me as well. So we appreciate that, as well as to Allie, thanks to Allie, and to Gigi. She uh, was one of the early invites that then, and a great colleague, so thank you for inviting me here, as well as my good friend Maureen. Uh, we do share an interest at Indiana Youth Institute. We are, we are charged with and we were envisioned and founded by Lilly Endowment to support every entity that is supporting youth workers and youth serving organizations across the state. So certainly that includes early education. Right? We also do a lot of data and we also talk a lot about how are our kids doing in the state. And so many of those things, as we talk about them, start in those early years. Everything from maternal fetal health to early education to how their nutrition is, do they have safe outdoor spaces, all the social determinants of health. So we are interested in all of those components. Personally, I, as we said, as Mary had said, I am the child of two educators. Um, actually, my mother was the assistant director of the Hoosier Hills Area Vocational School in Bloomington, Indiana, and it ran a preschool, and it ran a preschool for the school district. I, they needed someone to work from three to five after the teachers left, and so I started, I had a job for many, many years in a, um, in a high quality. It's not too late, life. Tammy. <laughs> we can find another one so, for you. So, you know, that early education is near and dear. I'm also the mother of two, two children who benefited greatly from high quality early education. They're now both in college. My son just went, he's a freshman this year, so we're empty nesters. And of course, I'm uh, mother, daughter, spouse, working mom, all of those things as a Maureen. So it is a pleasure to be here with this group. As, as Marian said, I started off my nonprofit career working to prevent violence against women and children. So all of the necessities of childcare and supporting women are, are deeply embedded in my DNA. Is that, is that good? That's is that enough? Right. Okay. 
All right, so with that, uh, we'll just start. We have some questions. We thought it might be a little more interesting if we if we bounce back and forth. So really, if I can, Maureen, I'll just jump right in. Please do. And we'll start with, you know, we do have a lot on our hands with K-12, right? We know that. We know that as a state. We know that as families. Some might say that's enough to focus on. Why, why, why do early education in addition? Yeah, it's definitely a target-rich environment, um, but this is a really important part of it. And I've, I've had the opportunity, some say I can't hold a job, actually. Um, I have a board member back here. That's not true, Jill. <laughs> um, but I've had the opportunity to work in healthcare. I've worked for in workforce development. I've worked in uh, a STEM program in the, in the K-12 system as well. And um, you know, in all of those environments, we talked about the same things. We talked about, you know, as we look for new team members, what we really need are, we used to call them 21st century skills, it seems quaint now, but, you know, we need persistence, we need resilience, we need people who can communicate effectively and can collaborate with their peers um, and to persist through a challenge and, um, and have curiosity about what it is they should be doing next. Those skills, it is not an exaggeration to say, have their foundation in my world, right? Long before anyone ever walks through a schoolhouse door, you have formed the basis for those fundamental skills. And so I think um, from that standpoint, we really just can't get there fast enough. The other thing I'll say is, um, you know, investments in high quality early learning uh, have the potential to do really dramatic things in people's lives. And they don't always, and I want to be honest about that. It matters what the quality is of the services that we're providing. Um, but when they are at their best, uh, there is lots of evidence that children will do better academically, that they will be more likely to graduate from high school and more likely to graduate on time. Um, and even that they'll be more productive in the workforce all the way down the road. And so um, we won't get those results out of every single uh, early learning service that we provide, but we ought to aim for that because that's where the potential is. Awesome. Thank you. So I, I heard some sighs when Maureen talked about the cost <laughs> of, of high quality early care. You know, is it, is it even realistic for most young parents to afford the type of high quality care that we wish that they, and we know that our students need and our little ones need. So these numbers are, are changing. It's because of the, of the pandemic, they've continued to grow. But what we know is that for all early care and education, it's about $10,000 a year for a family. For an infant, um, it's about 12,000. And in a really high quality center in Marion County, like the ones that we operate, it's over $18,000 a year for an infant. So if you compare that to um, what you might be putting into your child's 529 plan, um, it's a tremendous obligation that we, uh, that we place on families. And the truth of the matter is, as expensive as this is, it's not enough. Because we'll talk later about the challenges it creates in the way in which we compensate our workforce on the other side of the equation. So I think it's something we really have to confront as a, as a state and as a country. So currently, um, there are some public subsidies available. Uh, and they are available to people earning up to 127% of the federal poverty level. If you're a normal person, you don't know what that means. Um, but for a single mom with two kids, that means she can't earn more than about $28,000 a year. So uh, it's really a very, very low bar. Um, and so, you know, I think we may never get to universal childcare or universal pre-K, but I can't envision a world in which we're not helping families at higher uh, levels of income that are still quite low or, or the low side of moderate to afford these services. Wow, wow, $18,000. It's, it's gone up since my kids were little, as I said, they're in college. But, but you know, we know our families feel that. One of the things that we often say, and I've, I've collaborated with Maureen and, and even her predecessor enough to know high quality matters. Quality matters in early education, and we often say that, and, and I know enough to say high quality consistently <laughs> without, without. But what does that really mean? How do folks know? when it is high quality, what, cause it could feel good, right? That's it right. could, you could go into a center and you could, you could, they could be welcomed warmly and have a great experience. So they think, how do we tell the difference? 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I, I say that what you're looking for, um, it still may feel chaotic to you, right? But it's organized chaos. There's a plan behind the chaos, and it's signs of that plan are really what you're looking for. Because we want children to be in a play-based environment. We certainly don't need very young children, you know, sitting in columns and rows with worksheets. That is, that is not what good, good learning looks like. And I'd say we probably need less of that in K-12, too. Um, but what we, what we need then in that play-based environment is to make sure that there's a plan for the chaos, that um, there are lots of different areas of learning around the room so that if, you know, Maddie, my, my little one, if she were interested in, you know, doing a puzzle today or um, solving a math challenge or um, doing some reading, she has the opportunities to do all of those things. So you really want there to be just a lot of uh, rich educational materials all around the room. And then you want to see some evidence that there's a game plan, which in this world is called a curriculum. And you know, teachers will iterate on that, on that curriculum. They don't need to be following it to a T, but you need to understand what the, what the plan is overall. I will say we have then invested in some things that are really helping us get better at what we do. And we, like everyone else in this world, within our own centers that we operate, have room for improvement. Um, because honestly, as a country, we're just not that great at early learning services yet. We have, we have more work to do. So some of the things we're doing are um, bringing in uh, several formative assessments so that are helping us uh, get better at teaching children math and early literacy skills and um, being able to track them over time. And we just think it's critically important that we build that foundation in the early years. And so in a high quality setting, you should certainly see evidence of that as well. Um, and that actually brings me to my next question, because I know that IYI has been participating in some very significant uh, early literacy efforts recently announced, and I wonder if you could share a little bit about that and describe how um, the high quality early learning and the work that we're doing connects up to what happens next in K-12. Certainly, certainly, and there's a lot evolving in this space, and it's, it's really exciting for our state. We, uh, in fact, I was just at the Department of Education all day today working they have a partnership with the Hunt Institute. If you're not familiar with that group, please Google them because they're coming in and I know some folks here are very familiar with them. Um, so we were doing some strategizing today and really where we're leaning in is even on those early years for literacy. You know, I, I, again, the Department of Education is gonna do a terrific job and there's such great aspirations and strategies and plans being built there. We're also talking about those really little, little, little people, we call them our little people, that, you know, as early as six, eight, 12 months, children understand sounds. They understand that there is what you talk about, if you're talking about a banana, a banana in a book is a banana that they eat later in the day. And that's a really unique cognitive connection that humans have. And so we need to be talking to them. We need to be reading to them. And that talking, I mean, that sounds simple, right? You talk to, you talk to very young children. But the reality is there's been a decline in that. Any guesses why that is? Cell phones, exactly, exactly. So we're not, we're not making eye contact as much, we're not talking to our children as much, and therefore those early literacy skills, how do sounds show up? How, you know, what can we do? What should we be doing to make those connections at very young ages? So we recently were, were doing some work on that and encouraging folks um, through, through a public awareness campaign to say, here are some easy things you can do. Um, you do want to talk to your children from a very early age. Have them follow along, you know, in the book. They can start to make those connections. An 18-month-old child can follow along with their finger in a book. You know, so you need to let them. The other thing, I, I, we, we read a lot. I, my parents are both teachers, educators. We read a lot. This I did not do, do with my own children, so I feel guilty about it. So you all take it for what it is. They said, let them finish the story. Let them create the end of the story. You know, they like to read the same stories over and over again. It doesn't have to end the same way. You don't have to do it the exact same way. If they want to tack on two more whatever, um, Duck for President was one of our favorite books. It's a, great, it's a great book. You know, if they want to add on a couple more farm animals, let them do that because that creativity with words is also important. Another quick tip, do not babble. No babble. No baby talk. If they baby talk, don't, re don't repeat that. Use real words with them. 
they understand and they need to learn how, how things sound. Those kinds of things from a very young age helps prepare them and reinforces what they're learning in your environment. And, they, and, and I know you said five, age five. Uh, some of our research even will scooch that down a little. The American Academy of Pediatrics said those first three years are when most of those connections are made. I'm absolutely right. And you know, another thing that we're seeing in the early ed space, um, it's similar to what you were sharing, but is uh, you know, pandemic effects. And so um, not only were children in and out of our settings on a very regular basis for the last couple of years, but we were also in trying to do the very best that we could do from a public health standpoint, wearing masks around young children all the time, which makes language development very challenging. And so um, I know in our world, we certainly feel the pressure of overcoming that learning loss, even uh, you know, with, with children under five years old who have you know, spent the majority of their lives during the pandemic. And I wonder, um, we feel the urgency around that because we know how important it is that we right the ship as soon as possible, given what we're seeing in K-12. So I wonder Absolutely. what you'd add. Absolutely, and I was gonna say one of the things that we're, we're also looking for those promising practices around the country. There is an initiative in Birmingham, Alabama called Birmingham Talks. And, and it's a commitment that they're gonna talk to their youngest citizens and constantly talk, which sounds simplistic enough, but again, sometimes we can learn and replicate and bring those initiatives here to our community. Lastly, I'll just say as far as that early literacy, they talk about a lot of us probably held little people on our laps or beside us to read. That connection between comfort and reading is very, very important. That it becomes a positive thing. It's not an assignment. It's not something, because as they get older, they are assigned reading, right? But early on, if you can embed it as, that's a great thing that I do with fill in the blank. My parents, my neighbor, my aunt, my whatever that is, that, that changes how they perceive reading and literacy for their lifetime, which is really important. But I will also say that as far as we're talking about the pandemic effects in school systems, um, I don't need to read you the data if you all read it this week, but our NAEP scores, do you all? Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, Not you heard them, you do. Okay, mixed bag. So I will give you our NAEP scores were released Monday, which NAEP stands for the National Assessment of Educational Progress 33% of fourth graders, 33% of fourth graders, and 31% of eighth graders in our state were proficient or better at reading. A third. So if you walk into a classroom and there's 30 children, of fourth graders, 31% of them are going to be proficient in reading in our state. That's that, and as we talk about even as for their well-being, of course, we're really interested in that. And as you talk about workforce development, if only 30% of our fourth graders and 33% of our eighth graders are proficient at reading, where's, where are we going? And what do we do about that? 40% of our fourth graders and 30% of our eighth graders were proficient or better at math. A Little bit better, but not great. I don't think any of us would be satisfied with 30 or 40 percent. The proficiency rates were lower than in 2019, which is not surprising given, given all that we've gone through, um, except for fourth grade reading, which was really the same. So we're around the national average as it pertains to the reading scores. So think about that, even as a country. And we're slightly better in math. Slightly better in math. So that idea of what else can we do and how else can we do it, particularly in their early years and how do we build those foundations, I think are more critical than ever. You know, we're, we need to make those positive leaps forward to say, how do we, how do we get ourselves out of this? Correct. Yeah. So is it okay? Get ourselves <laughs> out it of okay? it, Tammy. <laughs> is it okay to say, I mean, obviously we believe that early learning produces long-term outcomes positive long-term outcomes. Why is it so hard to make it more accessible? I mean, I think you yeah. hear those numbers, you think good, you know, if you've experienced high quality 
early learning, you've seen the benefits firsthand, so there's, there's data, there's research, there's personal experience, there's plenty of anecdotes. Why is it so hard? Yeah, so I, I would say it's a couple of things. And first and foremost, the math just doesn't work in this world. Uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, margins are so slight that if you are operating an early learning center or a licensed ministry, and you, a registered ministry, and you have, um, you know, one, two, three seats open, you are probably experiencing operating losses. It is that tight. Um, and so uh, we know from lots of experience that it's really, really challenging just to make the math work. So there's not incentive for people to get into the game. The second thing is, there is a really high regulatory burden. So you're asking people to do uh, you know, very challenging work and um, you know, putting very high standards on them to do that. And so people just don't climb over those barriers and we've got work to do to think about that as a state. And the last thing, and this one is becoming more and more uh, problematic, and it's always been a little problematic, and that is the early learning workforce. So um, you can't open a new center if you can't staff it. And we just did some work uh, with the Indiana Business Research Center that showed that all around the state, since the start of the pandemic, the early care and education workforce has declined about 9%. And in Marion County, that number is over 15%. And so. When you take the lack of staff that we all complained about in 2019 and then think about that further um, decline, it's just impossible to think about how do we grow access until we can build that workforce. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how can we create new, faster pathways into the early care and education uh, environment so that um, people can look at apprenticeships or other training models to get here to productivity faster. Um, it's a challenge, though, because when we invite people to work for us, we're inviting to them, it's a little better in our world, but in the early care and education world in general, we're inviting them to a career path that leads to a $23,000 a year job on average. And so uh, I, if I um, uh, work in a kindergarten class, I'll make just about twice as much as I do as a new teacher in a pre-kindergarten class. And so I think I'll serve five-year-olds instead of four-year-olds. There's every incentive to move on as soon as I have the credentials to do so. The other problem that we experience, and this one was surprising to me, it's the working conditions. And so, uh, you know, folks come to work in a single room surrounded by often happy, sometimes unhappy young children. Uh, you know, they've been known to have a bad day, ear infection, that sort of thing. And so they're in this environment pretty much all alone. And we put constraints on them like, please call someone if you need a restroom break. We'll come and relieve you so that we don't uh, get out of ratio. If you think about yourself in your own professional setting and how you would feel about working in that kind of environment where there's so much control because we can't leave children unattended. And so, um, you know, we think a lot about how do we learn from other industries, learn from K-12 and um, do everything we can to create more flexibility in this work than what we currently have. So I know you've been doing work in this area too and I wonder if there are any lessons for the early education field as you think about other youth workers. Certainly, and I would echo uh, several of those things. It can, and you know, it's hard work. It's hard work, and it seems like play, but when you do it well, it's very intentional, and it's draining. It's draining, can be draining physically, but it certainly dra can be draining emotionally, right? When all of those, however many, tell me the ratio, Maureen, how many? Well, it depends on the age of the child, but right. so <laughs> one to four, one, one, to, to, <laughs> one to 10. So they're looking at you and they need everything from you. You know, they need all of those things. In as we talk about youth worker well-being is something that we're really digging deep into right now. And one of the biggest challenges there is, is vicarious trauma. And, you know, as Maureen shared a couple of those um, examples where uh, children, you know, were left at the center because the parents had addiction issues, um, or there were there was trauma in their home. All of those youth workers, be they in early care or later, that that comes to rest on their shoulders and it rests in their heart. I can tell you to this day stories of families that I served ten years ago right, and the trauma that they experienced and the trauma that they witnessed as part of their job, which is very, very different than other, than other places of employment. So we're looking at how do we help support them through that. They have the heart for the work, they have the credentials for the work. How do we acknowledge the fact that you could 
be vicariously traumatized by knowing that those two children didn't have the right food or they don't have stable care at home. How do we care for the caregivers is, is one of those things. And then how do we show up as organizations? Because you know I know that this is a challenge. I believe this is a challenge in your area. It's certainly a challenge for many other youth serving organizations. How do we provide healthcare benefits for all of them. It was, it was surprising to me a few years ago in talking and working with some good friends at The Journey, if you're, if you're familiar with The Journey Fellowship, and, and going and talking with some of the folks that were going through this great renewal program. And I said, how are you feeling about it? And there was a woman and she said, it was, it's great and I love it. And she worked in a program in Seymour, Indiana. And she said, but I'm thinking about starting a family and my organization doesn't provide maternity leave. So I think I'm gonna to have to get out of youth services. And you think, gosh, we're serving kids, right? We're serving kids. And, and I'm looking at Jill Robish, so I'm gonna say something, do not, I love bankers, I started my career in banking. So, you know, I often say, if we're not modeling the kind of care that we need for our families, I, I do say the accountants won't do it first. Um, <laughs> but, but we do need to walk the walk as you serving providers. We need to provide nurturing environments that allow you to go to your kid's soccer game or to go to your school performance or to take maternity leave. We're caring for families and kids. And so that's something we're trying to work on from, from the individual level so that we can provide care to those individual youth workers so that they feel supported. Um, we're talking about one model that we're kind of exploring is drop-in support groups, kind of like AA, but for youth workers. To say you had a challenge today with X, Y, and Z, drop in, go to a meeting, talk to some other folks that have had the same experience. You know, be renewed, have some validation, perhaps get some new ideas. We're also talking about as organizations, how do we better support those folks that we all rely on every day. I know, uh, you know, I talk, we, we work a lot with Ivy Tech. And we have a great partnership there. And I've had a wonderful conversations about high demand, high wage jobs. And I am constantly reminded, and also by my good friend Maureen, there are also high value jobs. That by, that by having those jobs in place, it ripples through the economy. So that's how we're kind of coming at it, which we hope to be able to benefit your workforce as well. There were lots of good ideas in there, so I'm <laughs> feeling more optimistic already. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. So I think we have two more questions. I think that's right. I think we have two more. So the legislative session, I know someone mentioned the, the, the uh, signs that are around. I had the great pleasure just a couple weeks ago at a Indiana Women for Change initiative, an event gathering to talk about civic engagement for young people, even, even really little ones. So if you want to hear about that another time, we could go through that because even these little kids can start to practice civic engagement, which is exciting. Um, legislative session is just around the corner. What's on your wish list to improve early education for Indiana kids? It's a long list, but I'll give you just four things. Um, and it starts with one I already mentioned, which is really looking at the regulatory environment. So there is a 180 page interpretive guide for how we comply with the regulations in Indiana. Um, we have a lot to do with the uh, hundreds of children clamoring for us at any time. We have to get to a place where we're spending less time working on compliance issues. We can't trade off the health and safety uh, needs that we have, so, but there's, there's work to do there to get that 180 down to something manageable. Um, the second is, is perhaps the most important, so I should have started with it, which is we have to think about what is it that we mean by kindergarten readiness. In Indiana, we don't really know how our early education system's doing because we've never told it what we want it to do. And so the state has some work to do to set that bar for kindergarten readiness so that we can um, improve our services and, and make sure that we're meeting it. And that taxpayers are getting what they're paying for. Um, the third goes back to our, our last conversation, which is we have to do more to incentivize alternative training pathways and ways for our workforce to continue to um, survive and thrive. And we recognize that if we're only paying the salaries that we're currently paying, and that's kind of all we can do given where we are, um, which will be my next point, uh, you, we, we have to think about how do we get folks productive just as quickly as possible. If they're just going to be passing through in their career in our world, 
Um, you know, if they plan to stay for three years, how do we keep them for four or five? And what are the incentives we can do to do that? And then lastly, um, you know, we have to think about the income eligibility requirements to qualify for a subsidy. We just have to, and there will be worthy debates all across the state and the country about what that looks like and where the right levels are. Um, but what we know is that current state is really not working and the end result is going to be an early care and education system that basically collapses on itself here over the next couple of years as pandemic era dollars go away. So that's what we're thinking through and how can we be relevant to that conversation. Thank you, thank you. That's it's a hefty list. list. <laughs> it's a, a hefty list. And, and yet, this is the time to do it, right? Our state, as we know, is headed into a budget session. Um, we have some financial resources that are there, so it's encouraging to hear that you're going you're gonna to ask a lot, which is wonderful. So we have a room full of people here that, that are interested, right? We thank you all for being here. Um, we all want young people to thrive. It's in all of our best interests. I often, Indiana Youth Institute, we do a lot of data, and we love data, and I love data. And, and I can tell you a whole bunch of all kinds of numbers. And, and often, one of the things that we're asked is, great, I get it. Like, I understand. I understand. We understand how expensive it is. We understand the, the high need. We understand. So what do you want me to do about it? At the end of the data, all the data, all the information is wonderful, and we need to be data-based, we need to be research-based, we need to be evidence-based, and we say no data for, for data's sake. It should all be action-oriented. So, so with that concept, I hope you all take that as a friendly <laughs> call to action. How can people help? How can people help? Yeah, well, it starts with some very simple things. Um, first off, thank an educator if you see one. Uh, early educators really do have tremendously difficult jobs, and um, they're kind of under the radar. They don't have, um, you know, when we talked about essential workers early in the pandemic, I heard a lot from our team that we're not on any of these yard signs. Why is that? And we're here working every day in our centers, and I think um, we can help respond to that. The second is to volunteer at a center, ours or someone else's. I promise you will leave happier than when you came. Um, people will, uh, they will hug you, they will paint on you. Um, they may or may not uh, give me a haircut on a regular basis, but with very blunt scissors, so it works out well. Um, Thirdly, of course, use your voice and the, and the, the power of advocacy to um, push for the kinds of changes that we've talked about here today. Um, and lastly, and this one's maybe a little less obvious, have a conversation with your employer about what's going on within your workplace. We see corporations getting more and more engaged every year, and they want to help, but they don't quite know what to do next. And so um, organizations like ours can help them answer those questions. So if you can just get us connected, we are glad to continue the conversation from there. Wonderful. So I think, I think we're question and answer. Either Yes. Fantastic. Um, this isn't necessarily an early child who's been using Winter's May story for eighth graders. What do we do for the other seventy percent that are behind and getting them up to speed? I mean, what kind of program can we put in place to do that? Because is this just gonna be a lost generation of new students who well such a great question. I wish I knew what to do. I know bits and pieces. There are lots of folks that are out there working on this. And I will say, I don't, I don't I honestly believe it's going to be a lost generation. Unfortunately, as we said, the numbers are slightly down. They're not dramatically down. This isn't just, this isn't just a pandemic issue. This is, this is an ongoing persistent issue. And in fact, today, as I said, we were talking about literacy rates at the Department of Education. In, in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, our literacy rates were higher and our iLearn scores were higher. They started to decline around 15, 16. So now we're saying, what was going on then that is different and, and what maybe can we learn from that? What can we learn from the surrounding states? How do we start to incorporate some of this in? I will say, you know, one of the, one of the discussions that's been going on is, how do we, you know, you can't take kids out of class to catch them up because they're going to be missing more class, right? And so it's this circular. So there is this want to make sure there is a seamless participation with out of school time programs. You know, there's a tremendous number of great programs um, in our, across our state 
that can help reinforce and do some of that additional work outside of school hours. Now again, today the um, Association of Small and Rural Schools was also talking about in small communities, if you stay after school, how do you get home? How do you get home? And so then how do you, how do you run a after school bus if your bus route is 80 miles, right? And so having some of those conversations on how do we solve those issues, but I do think there is a renewed momentum and commitment and commitment in theory as well as commitment financially in our state right now that is exciting to see. skills, do we see that as maybe one of the reasons why we went to site words or whatever for some of this lack of reading skills? I think, and I'll just go quickly because I do want to pop it back, but I think the science of reading, and if you, again, dive in and do some research, I am certainly not an expert on that, but teaching that science of reading of how does the brain really work, and I also, I think it's brilliant that they have determined it is a science, right? Because you, you it's not just um, warm fuzzy. There is a science to it, and as our state starts to lean into the science of reading and make sure that we're training educators and also honoring their time in learning additional things by compensating educators to learn new things, which is exciting, which I know is part of Dr. Jenner's program as well. So that science of reading approach um, does, you know, it's new, it's, it's going backwards to some of the best part, but it's also going forward to some new, um, pulling some of that forward, which I, I think is really exciting, will benefit our state greatly. It'll take a few years to, to get fully embedded, but, but I know they're off to a great start already. There's just one other point I would add, and while it's not my day job, uh, part of my bio was that I also chair the Purdue Polytechnic High School, and I think a real risk that we have is that those eighth graders are just checking out, right? I mean, they are disengaging from the world around them. So I think we have to think about how is it that we are providing services to high schoolers in a much richer and more engaging way. So our model at Purdue Poly is um, first of all, very cross-functional, but it's also really based around the problems that students might encounter in the real world. And so I think we've got to do more of that to get particularly um, black and Hispanic children who have checked out at eighth grade, uh, meeting them where they are in their learning. levels were just so oh. quite hard. I had, um, the school was very proud because they had <laughs> built a lovely new gym for basketball. And what they did be, to do that was they only had so much money. So they, they mainstreamed a lot of children who needed special services into the regular classroom. And as I was teaching art, I noticed that I had kindergartners who had never held a pencil, a crayon, or a pair of scissors. And you, <laughs> you spend so much time doing that that you have another whole classroom who, who has. And I'm just saying you have to meet the kid where they are and how they learn. It's, it's impossible to think that every kid fits into the same box. Well, that's exactly right, and I, I will say, you know, if, if you talk to 100 kindergarten teachers, I guarantee you they'll tell you, oh, I can absolutely sec separate my, cl my class between the children who've had early learning experiences and those who haven't by exactly those things. Do they know which way a book goes, or are they reading it, you know, upside down and backwards? And um, we, we have to take where they are as a starting point. I couldn't agree more. Well, and I even think we've heard a little bit from the Department of Education on, on the pandemic effects of that. You know, it made sense. You had to keep your kids home, right? You had to keep your kids home. Maybe before you were, you were working out of the home, 
and now you're there. And, and they said that they've seen a lot of folks that have said, well, this kind of worked okay. Maybe I'm working remotely permanently or part of the time I'm going to continue this pattern. What, what DOE was reporting is, and there were particularly a few very um, passionate superintendents, was that then that's delaying when they come to kindergarten. They were hearing their kindergarten teachers are saying we're, have to, we're having to teach some of those basic skills because the children didn't have the opportunity to learn them in pre-K. billions of dollars in surplus. And the governor said, I don't know how to solve, I don't know how to spend it. So when you look at education, where can we put the money for the most good for the longest term? You can spend a lot of money quickly, but what would be the best way to spend money in education to get us in a better spot? Why, we'll thank, let you for, thank you for that question. You know, by 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 conservative estimates, there's a four to one return on investment for investments in early learning, and some estimates go, you know, triple that. And so, and it's in a lot of things. It shows up in less remediation of you know kindergartners and third graders. It shows up in less grade repetition um, and uh, and you know fewer supportive services provided along the way. So really we do think that for your um, incremental dollar, uh, you, there is no better bet than early education. Well, and again, as, as Maureen talked about advocacy and using your voice, um, you know, talking about those early investments and the payoff long term. You know, I, I often think about the fact that we don't say as a state, we're not the state that reads, we're not the state that thinks, we're not the state that cares, we're the state that works. And so understanding that, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that's, that's our state motto, right? And so how do we tie in and make it very clear to the folks that are making those budget decisions that the reality of it is by investing in early, in early education, we are preparing our workforce. That is a workforce investment. It just takes a little time to pay off, right? And so we can certainly do that. We can make that case, the data is there, the research there. We just have to keep reiterating that this is a workforce issue. If we mandate, mandate kindergarten, what would that cost the state? If we mandated early learning, what would that cost the state? So it's hard to say because there are some sources of funding already, but here's for rough math, it's about $7,000 a year for um, pre-kindergarten services under our On My Way Pre-K program. And there are about 85,000 children in each age group. We currently invest about $22 million a year in pre-kindergarten services in Indiana. So through that investment we serve, uh, it depends on how we blend with federal sources, but somewhere between three and 5,000 children of the 85,000. That's all we're helping? That's right. 5,000 out of 85. And it's limited to what counties? Uh, it's in all counties now, um, but, still, but you know, still only $22 million, and as far as that stretches. All right, I've been the person that's had to do the hook before, so I want to be <laughs> respectful of... Allie, tell me, do we have time for one more question? Or? One more. I just want to insert something. I, okay, okay. I saw a study came out that there's only one mother of a young child being under the age of 18 currently serving out of 150 legislators. Hmm. And that could also be hmm. what's going on with the priorities in our money. That's good. So, yeah, one okay, more. one last. Were you saying that was the number of child uh, reading your math. math? Reading your math. Okay, I think it was. Was it like reading is thirty one percent of fourth graders yes. and thirty three percent of eighth graders. Math, I think, was thirty percent of fourth graders and forty percent of eighth graders. Those are the two scores that we measure consistently. Okay. Thank you. And could I just say one thing? That's scores. That include all ch all children, regardless of race or income level. Okay. That the, the the numbers are significantly lower for black and brown children. Oh, absolutely. absolutely.
Marianne, and also for foster children and for any children with any sort of yeah. cognitive or oh, physical yeah. disabilities. I mean, we're talking, I know in Indianapolis, five, five to seven percent, five percent to seven percent of children are passing. <laughs> we are failing our children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we don't have to. That's the optimistic note. You're not paying for prison. That's right. There's the place to I told you all she was amazing. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you two very much. I want to thank you. So, one thing that they didn't touch on, but I want to give a plug for early learning in general is. My son, who's five, he's autistic. Had it, he's my only child. None of my siblings or nieces and nephews live close. Had I not had a educated childcare worker say at, when he was two, you should go seek out uh, supports because we think or seek out testing. It's because of those early interventions that my son at five is mainstreaming and doing very well. So when it comes to kids who are neurodiverse or with other disabilities, it's those early learning, uh, people in early learning centers who are there, preschools who are there to catch that. Because a lot of parents, we don't realize. Yeah. Everyone kept saying, oh, my kid didn't speak until they were three, or oh, my kid did, and everyone's kid is different, but, yeah. so. Oh, we certainly do. Um, we have a waiting list, and right now our, our challenge is our staff. So we have um, you know, more than 50 openings right now in, in our staff positions. Um, and many of those have been opened for six months or more. So, I want to I want thank you all very much for spending time tonight, and thank you all for caring so much about this topic to be here with us. Because uh, we're talking about ourselves tying our future to our past. This is how we build a great future together. So I just want to thank you all. I want to round of applause for our speakers. on November 9th and Salon on November 12th and back in February for our second in the series with our uh, female presidents of universities. So thank you all for coming tonight. Hey, thanks. Looking forward to it.